Welcome everybody to Paleo Talks. This week we have special guest, Dr. Tom Holtz. How are you doing, Thomas? Doing pretty well. Great, great. Well, we're excited to have you and it's also Darwin Day and we're excited to be celebrating his birthday. Uh, there are other uh, holidays happening today as well. What else is there? I think there's Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese New Year also right. happening this year. So lots of things to celebrate. And today we're going to be talking about actual uh, Charles Darwin and the fossil record. And so Dr. Holtz is going to be filling us in on that. And before we move any farther, David, if you could go ahead and let everybody know how the show works. I think we're going to have some new people today. Absolutely. So uh, for the returning folks, it's going to be the same general format as usual. We're going to start off by letting our guest, Dr. Holtz, give a presentation about Darwin. Uh, and in that time, feel free to use the comment section of Facebook video to uh, appreciate and say ooh and ah and admire the presentation. And then about halfway through the program or so, we're going to start taking questions from the audience. So the second half or, or thereabouts of the program is going to be led by audience Q&A. So we'll remind you when that is happening to start sending your questions to us via the comments in the Facebook comment section. And as always, if for any reason you can't leave a comment on Facebook, I'll be keeping an eye on the Gray Fossil Site Twitter and Instagram accounts, and you can send us a message over there as well. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, as usual, we also have Dr. Chris Widga as a co-host today. Hey, Chris. And we're coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University, which oversees the Gray Fossil Site and our paleontology program here in East Tennessee. Uh, again, we're really happy to have everybody. And if we could have Dr. Holtz go ahead and start the presentation and start the show here. Sure. And I, I'm Dr. Blaine Schubert and a big Darwin fan. We do big celebration here every year that we can. And I even got out my jacket out of the closet out of respect uh, today. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, I didn't tell you I was going to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, but uh, Dr. Holtz also has a tie on. Uh, today mm -hmm. as well. So you're all dressed up for it. And he, I think it's a special tie, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So uh, I got a, this was a tie I picked up at the American Museum of Natural History's exhibit about Darwin, which was held back in 2009 in the year of the great Darwin's bicentennial of his birth and the sesquicentennial of the publication of On the Origin of Species. Um, so, and it's a tie that's got animals that are relevant to Darwin plus some others kicked in. So we've got iguanas and rheas and finches and of course Galapagos tortoises uh, but also pufferfish and frogs because why not pufferfish and frogs are cool. <laughs> and again uh, Dr. Holtz is actually uh, an expert in dinosaurs and hopefully we can have him uh, talk about them at some point in the future but is a uh, follower of, of Charles Darwin and the history of Charles Darwin. And so we thought we would have him on if he could. And, and so again, so happy to have you. And one of the things we do sort of at the beginning of each show is just briefly talk about how you got into paleontology in the first place and what got you into paleontology? What schools did you go to? How did you end up where you're at now? Sure. So um, this is a story my parents told me um, it's far enough ago in my past that I can't verify it, but I have no reason to think that they lied. And that is when I was about three years old, uh, my brothers and I got a set of plastic toys and one of them got like a farm animal and one got a circus or zoo animal. And I got a dinosaur and it was either a brontosaurus or a tyrannosaurus, little um, plastic toy. And I asked what it was and they told me it was a dinosaur. So sure, you know, I'm learning shapes and colors, so dinosaurs. <laughs> and then a couple weeks later, we got another set and, you know, one of them got one of the animals, another got another animal. And if I didn't get Brontosaurus the first time, I got it the second time. Um, so, and I asked what it was and I was told a dinosaur. And apparently I looked really skeptically at my mom because how could these two things, you know, a Tyrannosaurus <laughs> and a Brontosaurus be called the same thing when you don't call cows and horses the same thing and they're obviously a lot more similar. Um, so I decided, and I asked, you know, how could they both be dinosaurs? And my mom didn't know, but she came from a background in education. So she said, we'll get a book and find out. And so uh, she found a copy of the How and Why Wonder Book of Dinosaurs, 
Um, so it was a 1960s, I guess it was, um, kid book on dinosaurs. And she and my grandma uh, used to read to me from it. And I decided then and there that I would grow up to be a dinosaur. And then I was told that wasn't going to happen. So I said, I'll grow up to study, to study dinosaurs instead. And unlike most people whose lives aren't really set at the age of three, uh, I didn't really ever deviate from that in my life. And so I stayed with it, um, you know, for good or for ill. Um, so from there, eventually I went on to uh, Johns Hopkins as an undergraduate. I was at the de uh, Department of Earth and Planetary uh, sciences, so their geology department, to study paleontology. And at the time, in the, the mid-80s, um, in fact, most of the organismal biology at Hopkins was taught in the geology department. Uh, that, that At that time, a lot of focus in biology, more so even than today, was on genetics and cellular biology and so forth. Um, it, there's been in in general biosciences, a bit of a revival and renaissance of organismal biology. And that's good to see that's going on, but at that time, not so much. So went from there um, to do my PhD up at Yale, uh, where I was lucky enough to work with uh, the late John Ostrom, one of the seminal figures in dinosaur paleontology of the 20th century. Um, and uh, did my work on I was already obsessed with carnivorous dinosaurs. In fact, when I said I wanted to grow up to be a dinosaur, I specifically wanted to grow up to be Tyrannosaurus rex, because why not? If you're going to be one, you might as well be the king. And Thomas Richard Tyrannosaurus rex, we had a couple of the same initials. So, um, And so I, I did my work there on theropod phylogeny and biomechanics and biogeography, which have been issues that I've continued to research ever since. So then from grad school. Um, I did my postdoc years in a very different part of paleontology. Uh, my wife, well then fiance, was living down in the DC area. And since I had finished up my coursework, I could do my dissertation writing back here while also getting a job. So I wound up working with the US Geological Survey and their micropaleo unit back when there was a, a branch of paleontology and stratigraphy, and specifically working on climate change issues. So instead of working on giant creatures from you know, the late Cretaceous, I was working on plio-pleistocene podocopid ostracods, which are these little That's about crustaceans. about as far at the other end of the spectrum. Exactly, <laughs> and not only in terms of scale and so forth, but also in terms of the type of science you do. Because you know, normally I'm really happy when, oh wow, we found a single toe bone, yay! And here we would have <laughs> 300 specimens on one slide. Um, <laughs> So you could do an entirely different sort of paleontology, much more statistically rigorous and so forth. And the goal then was to look at um, the last time slice in Earth history when at least during the summertime, the Arctic Ocean was ice free and uh, it was used as a model to try to look as part of a bigger project to look at Pliocene, you know, mid to late Pliocene climates um, as a model of the potential near future uh, with increased human generated climate change. Um, but that was only a four year gig. And um, I managed to wind up teaching at the University of Maryland, started teaching there in 94. I've been teaching there full time since 95, um, teaching a number of paleontology classes, but also other parts of geology like um, global change science and historical geology and so forth. And since 1999, I've been in charge of a program, a living learning program under the umbrella of what's called College Park Scholars, um, where we have for two years, for freshman and sophomore years, a dedicated group of students of all majors who do sort of a deep dive into big multidisciplinary issues and in from 99 to 2009, the program was called Earth, Life, and Time and was specifically focused on natural history and evolutionary science. And then from 2009 to the present, it's a program, it's shifted focus and it's now called Science and Global Change. And, and was, fact, it that, was it that program that allowed you to go to the Galapagos? Exactly. So um, one of the things that we were supposed to try to develop with this living learning program was try to find experiential learning options on all scales from, you know, visiting local uh, 
uh, local environments and local labs and so forth up to international travel. And so through the Earth Life and Time program, we did a series of trips to the Galapagos, uh, which had been a lifetime goal for me. And I was able to get the university to pay for it. So that was cool. Um, and so got to see firsthand these creatures and these spots that I had read about since I was a little kid or seen on nature shows. And if you have the option and you're up and, and you know, when, when we're back in a world where ecotourism is possible and when, you know, you weigh the pros and cons of ecotourism, if you're interested going, getting to the Galapagos is a, a wonderful experience. The wildlife is for the most part, extremely naive. They don't yet largely regard humans as a threat. And so you could be much closer to these animals than you might in the, equi the equivalent species on the continent. Um, and you, know, you can wind up swimming with penguins and hmm. seeing flightless cormorants and watching uh, the various sorts of Darwin's finches doing all their different specializations and hanging out with the uh, land iguanas and the marine iguanas and the uh, lava lizards and of course the giant tortoises. Um, and seeing <laughs> these spots that, you know, if you look into history that you've uh, read about in terms of the discoveries of Darwin. And that's sort of when I was already interested in Darwin since I was a kid, but having to teach this course, uh, I had to you know, read up a lot on the context of the voyage of the Beagle and the research since. Uh, and so I got even greater appreciation of, of some of the accomplishments that Darwin did, so. All right, well, thank you for all that background. That's really fun to hear. I know our, our uh, watchers really enjoy hearing that. And I think one of the fun things we, we get to hear is these paths that paleontologists take. And almost all of the paleontologists we talk to say, as a kid, I wanted to study dinosaurs. And, but very few paleontologists actually end up staying with that. And so that's kind of interesting, the different branches. But I think it's interesting. Uh, I mean, it, it's invigorating to look at dinosaurs as such a catalyst uh, mm. you know, for the study of paleontology, even if that's not what somebody ends up doing. Exactly, exactly. They're, they're a great way to bring people into the field. And then from that, you know, science is about asking questions. And sure, there are a lot of questions asked about dinosaurs, but there's a whole vast world of fossil life that we need to understand better. And so, you know, yes, Tyrannosaurus and Spinosaurus, they're cool, and it's fun to work on them. <laughs> but there's great information to find out about all kinds of organisms. So if you're interested in paleontology, consider the vast panoply of life uh, and not just the big showy guys. Exactly. And yeah, we'll have you back on dinosaurs at some point, but let's talk great. about Darwin. Sure. All right. So when I was asked uh, to speak here, um, I was asked to speak about Charles Darwin and the fossil record. And we don't always think about Darwin having a connection to paleontology. Uh, but yet there actually is a strong connection to paleontology. And in fact, in some ways to creatures of the fossil record that many of us, um, even casual fans of the vertebrate fossil record are familiar with, but you might not make that connection with Darwin. So first of all, it is of course Darwin day. Uh, it is the anniversary of his birthday as well as Abraham Lincoln's birthday. They were both born within the same 24 hour period. Um, so, and, and you know, since the, really since the beginning of this century, I think uh, science scientists and science educators have been interested in, in promoting, using this day as a way of promoting our understanding of the natural world and of evolution. So um, as we were just talking about, I am a dinosaur paleontologist and my field of expertise are these wonderful guys, things like Tyrannosaurus um, and recently had a paper out with Dave Hone on Spinosaurus and I work on little theropods too, but I'm mostly a dinosaur worker. And Darwin was not a dinosaur worker, uh, but we all can appreciate him. He helped you know, us understand how it is that new species come to be, that ordinary non-metaphysical processes in nature are responsible for this wonderful diversity of life, both in the present and in the past. Um, but as I was saying, most of us don't necessarily associate Darwin with fossils. Uh, we might, for instance, associate him with the discovery of evolution and naively, you know, the apes into humans idea, which is not, a, uh, not at all a recent uh, stereotype. You know, here is a, within his own lifetime, 
look of, um, you know, that man wants to claim my pedigree. He says he is one of my descendants. Now, Mr. Darwin, how could you insult him so? So, um, or, you know, maybe you get a little more sophisticated and you know more about the science and we think about Darwin's contributions and a lot of his data coming from the living world. So looking at the diversity of finches on the Galapagos with their specializations in terms of their beaks and how this represents an adaptive radiation from a single ancestral form into many different modes of life. And you may know he looked at embryology and biogeography and so forth. And we forget that he got his start really as a geologist and indeed the opening paragraph of On the Origin of Species, actually the opening two paragraphs are specifically about paleontological questions. So here we go. Um, this is apparently a first edition. I don't have a first edition or anything like that. I found it on the internet. Um, and so here, uh, went on board HMS Beagle as naturalist, I was much struck with certain facts in the distribution of the inhabitants of South America and in the geologic relations of the present to the past inhabitants of that continent. Fossils, fossils of organisms are specifically what are referred to in the very first sentence of the origin. And then the next sentence, these facts seem to me to throw some light on the origin of species, that mystery of mysteries as it, has been, as it has been called by one of our great philosophers. Now, if you look up mystery of mysteries and Darwin and do a google.scholar.search, you'll find that most of the papers that come out that quote him act as if the phrase mystery of mysteries is about speciation. So simply where do species come from? Which is a great question. But notice he says, as it has been called by one of our greatest philosophers. Well, who's that philosopher? He doesn't say. But it turns out the philosopher in question is this guy, uh, Sir John Herschel, son of uh, the Herschel who discovered the planet uh, Uranus and one of the great uh, astronomers of his era. And, and Sir John Herschel himself was a, a polymath scientist of the early 1800s. And this phrase comes from a letter that John Herschel wrote to Charles Lyell, one of the great figures of geology who I'll come back to in a bit, that that letter was about Herschel's review of what came out in Lyell's great principles of geology. And it was quoted, passages from that letter were quoted in a work of Babbage, uh, the Ninth Bridgewater Treatise. And that's the reason Darwin was, was aware of this um, phrase. And the phrase was, of course, I allude to that mystery of mysteries, the replacement of extinct species by others. Herschel was not just talking about where do species come from? He was specifically asking a geologist about what is going on by the fact that one set of fossil organisms are replaced by another set of fossil organisms by another set, a paleontological question. So we really, when you read a lot of the literature that comes out on Darwin, people don't appreciate a central part of what he was trying to understand was the biggest pattern seen in paleontology. Not merely that there were extinct organisms, although that was a really cool discovery that had really only been recognized a generation before the latest 17 and earliest 1800s. And people began to realize, you know, the reason we don't know what Pterodactylus or Anoplotherium or Mammothus or Plesiosaurus or Megatherium, the reason we, they're not familiar to us is that they were extinct. That in and of itself was an interesting issue. But even more interesting was the fact that these didn't all live at the same time. There wasn't a prehistoric world, a fossil world, but a succession of fossil worlds, one after another after another, of which the most recent ones were creatures that were largely familiar to us or not radically different. And that as you went back earlier and earlier and earlier in time, were increasingly different from our modern world, which is a really intriguing question. Why should that be? Particularly for people who weren't necessarily certain about a continuity of life from one time phase to the next. So. As many of us know, uh, Darwin himself came from rather privileged origins, uh, not from the 
the nobility, but from a rich family. His, his grandfather, in fact, Erasmus Darwin, had written on evolutionary topics, or what they called at the time transmutationist topics. And um, Darwin's father was uh, a medical doctor. And at first, Darwin thought he would follow in his dad's footsteps, although he was always interested in, in living forms and in trying to figure out, you know, classify beetles and identify rocks and so forth. Uh, he did a short-term stint as an undergrad at Edinburgh, trying to be a medical student, apparently seeing his first operation in an operation theater put him off that. He had a rather sensitive uh, disposition to seeing humans being carved open, as I think many of us might, um, particularly in the days before anesthesia. And so he dropped out of Edinburgh, um, managed to get into Cambridge, specifically to train to be part of the parsonage, but really not because of any commitment to religion, but rather because many of the natural historians of his times had their day job working um, as a vicar somewhere and they'd be out in the countryside and could go and study things. So at his, um, at um, Christ College in Cambridge, they've actually, they've got a, a statue of him actually in their courtyard and they've restored his dorm room back to the way it looked at the time. I used to joke, you know, his, with his old posters up on the wall and they, they actually said, no, actually kind of, they found what prints he had checked out of the library to hang on his wall and they put those back up there. So, and while an undergrad, he did study a lot of natural history topics, uh, botany and zoology and geology. In fact, he was a student of Adam Sedgwick, one of the great geologists of the early 1800s. And indeed, after his graduation, but prior to going off on the voyage of the Beagle, Darwin helped Sedgwick in doing geologic mapping in Wales, um, as well as some other parts of England he was, or of Great Britain, he was mapping himself. So here's one of Darwin's geologic maps. And these are from a rather recent, or well, now 20 year old article about the travels of Darwin and Sedgwick in Wales. And this was an early phase of geology when people were still mapping out what bodies of rock were present and even more putting them into a larger chronological context. And in fact, that's probably what Sedgwick is most famous for, the namer of the Cambrian and the co-namer of the Devonian. So Darwin's post-undergraduate work was helping to add to the database to construct a geologic time scale. And one, that's, one thing that's great about Darwin and other writers of his time, other thinkers of his time, is that we have a lot of their notebooks uh, still with us that we can look at. And here is a quote from him, you know, some years later, uh, seven years later after his work in the field in Wales, geological chronology, that most sublime discovery of the genius of man. Now, I think those of us from our point of view might think that his own discoveries might be even more sublime, but it's great to see that this natural historian recognized that the idea of putting things into a historical context in geology was critical. But of course, he's not really famous for his work in the geology of Wales. He's famous for the discoveries on the voyage of the Beagle. So the Beagle was a, map, a British mapping vessel uh, it was using some of the latest technology in terms of clocks in order to help work out um, the question of longitude, which is a tricky, lat latitude's easier to work out based on the position of the stars. Longitude was a much more difficult nut to crack. And the Voyage of the Beagle under Captain Robert Fitzroy, uh, was that was part of the thing they were gonna do is test this new type of, of chronometer and do new mapping primarily of South America, but other spots around the world. And there was an opening for the captain's companion on board the ship. The captain uh, of these vessels, and Fitzroy included, were normally from the upper reaches of society. They weren't in this Victorian or actually immediately pre-Victorian world, weren't supposed to be fraternizing with working class people, which made up most of the crew. And so they were often the reason to have on board ships someone of a appropriate social status to fraternize with them. And if it would help if they were naturalists, because they could then contribute to the discoveries on the voyage. And Darwin was actually the third person on the list, but he managed to get on board. By the way, Fitzroy himself um, was a scientist. He was a meteorologist. And actually, he is the founder of the, th the concept. He even coined the word forecast. He developed the idea of a weather forecast, obviously something that uh, a maritime person is going to be very interested in. 
Fitzroy, um, as a gift to Darwin, uh, when he arrived onto the Beagle, gave him a copy of the first volume of Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, which is a foundational document in the history of our field. Um, it's the, up to that point, the strongest and most ple complete argument for the idea of uniformitarianism to look at the operations of the natural world around us now and understand that the geological forces or the geological structures, mountain ranges and strata and so forth, are themselves product of the same forces we see operating in the world with us today, extrapolated over vast, vast periods of time. By the way, Lyle became a close friend of Darwin later in his life after he got back onto, um, onto the mainland. And Darwin recognized the, very, the importance of this vast scope of geologic time. No one but a practiced geologist can really comprehend how old the world is as the measurements refer not to our revolutions of the sun or our lives. So the voyage of the Beagle was a, all the way around the world, but honest to goodness, the vast majority of it was spent going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth around South America to map all these little inlets and so forth. And one thing that was discovered very early on in the voyage is that Darwin was not a good person for boat life. He did not take to being on ships at all. Um, and wherever possible, if the Beagle was likely to come back to that port, you know, a week or a month or many months later, he would spend his time on land, sampling things there, plants, animals, rocks, and fossils. He managed even to do transects up into the Andes. So that's where he got a lot of his major contributions to paleontology. Of course, many other discoveries he made in the Galapagos Islands, um, but his paleontological contributions come primarily from South America, um, as well as geological ones. He constructed this geological cross-section uh, through the Andes. Um, as part of his work. And while up at some of the peaks of the Andes, he noted, as other observers had before, including his hero, uh, hum Humboldt, Alexander Humboldt, the great explorer of the previous century, that you can find marine fossils at the tops of mountains. So here are fossils that he brought back, including good old Gryphea. Those of us who work occasionally in marine deposits of the Mesozoic know this coiled oyster, Gryphea, very well. Um, used to be called Devil's Toenails uh, as a folk name in Great Britain. And so he brought these specimens back, eventually described by other researchers. And that's something that's worth noting. Even at that time, science was very collaborative. And Darwin would collect specimens, write up some notes and observations, pack them away. And many of these specimens of plants, animals, and rocks and fossils would then, after the return to England, be described by other researchers in detail. Associated with the work around the Andes, he was there, um, not in the town of Concepcion, but nearby uh, for one of the greatest earthquakes of the 1800s, where it was seen that the land was thrown up several feet along the coastline, um, as well as devastating some of the local uh, cities and towns. And he saw this as confirmation of Lyle's idea that relatively small changes could over time produce vast ones by seeing a, the coastline thrown up by a foot or two and the beached uh, shellfish on that to extrapolate that up to shellfish on the top of the Andes only required the extension of vast periods of time. It didn't require any special magical forces. But he actually did some real contributions to the discovery of the paleontological and specifically the vertebrate paleontological world that I think sometimes we're not as aware of. One of his first discoveries was not a brand new taxon, but one that was already established in paleontology, and that was a specimen of megatherium. So his first one of his first big encounters with the megafauna of South America was the mega creature itself, megatherium, the largest of the great South American native mammals. And so here he describes early on, uh, walking along and finding the head of some large animal embedded in soft rock. It took him nearly three hours to get it out. At the time, he judged it to be something uh, related to the rhinoceros. But when it was described back in England, the great paleontologist, Sir Richard Owen, recognized it. It was the giant ground sloth megatherium. 
And in fact, Sir Richard Owen would be the describer of most of the vertebrate fossils that Darwin would discover. Owen, a very famous figure in his own right in the history of paleontology, namer of Dinosauria, uh, describer of the, uh, the first discovered specimen of Archaeopteryx, uh, describer of the MOA, basically almost every field within at least terrestrial organisms, terrestrial vertebrates, he had a major contribution to, and uh, some of the marine ones as well. Um, a figure who was uh, one of the help, the founders of what would become the Natural History Museum of London, um, and a big public figure who unfortunately, later in his career was at loggerheads with Darwin and Darwin's advocates. So some of the specimens that Darwin discovered were in fact brand new species, genera and species to science. He made discovery of several new types of giant ground sloths. Mylodon, which Owen named the type species after Charles Darwin himself. Skeletotherium, the, which actually had a very good original specimen, or one of the most complete um, ground sloth specimens ever found up to that point. And much more fragmentary, something that became Glossotherium robustum, all Owen names for Darwin specimens. And here are what those taxa look like based on better discoveries later on. And Darwin didn't talk about it so much at the time, but it shows that within this one category of sloth, you could have an adaptive radiation or at least multiple variations of form living in the same region, doing things presumably in slightly different fashions similar to the finches in the Galapagos. Now, there were armor fragments that had been found before in the same rocks as Megatherium. And many people, including Darwin at first, thought that some of these armor fragments were from the giant ground sloth Megatherium. It does turn out that some of these ground sloths do actually have body armor. But at least some of the chunks of this body armor turned out to be a new type of creature that was in fact a giant armadillo. And from specimens that Darwin collected, Owen would name the name giver to the entire group of the giant armadillos, Glyptodon. So here's a very early reconstruction of Glyptodon and uh, the actual, an actual uh, specimen, although not that same specimen. A group which we've now recently discovered uh, based on, on genomic evidence, uh, apparently is nested, is, is a type of armadillo, uh, at least based on this DNA discovery. Darwin also found evidence of pre-Columbian horses, in fact, specifically Pleistocene horses in South America, contemporaries of things like Glyptodon and Megatherium. Uh, here's the tooth that he found, which Owen would name Equus curvidens. It turns out that um, it seems to belong to a previously named um, species of horse Equus neogaeus, um, but that there were apparently both the modern horse genus Equus and another fossil horse living side by side in South America in the Pleistocene up until the time of the megafaunal extinction. Oh, and actually, and here is that specimen, this tooth specimen on the same plate where this also describes some of the megatherium armor. But then there were some much stranger creatures that Darwin came across. Now, he wasn't quite, he didn't quite appreciate how strange they were at the time. And for that matter, neither quite did Owen. Uh, there were fossils of a large mammal, in fact, quite large, as it turns out, um, that had similarity to the camelids of South America today in at least the shape of their neck vertebrae and so forth. Things like, you know, the vicuña and the Wanako and you know, their, their domestic relatives, llamas and, and uh, alpacas. Um, and so this became named Macrochinia um, as a new genus of something. Owen wonders what the creature could have been. He kept on, keeps on making comparisons to camels, but recognizes it's not quite the same thing as a camel. So maybe some relation. Later discoveries would give us much more complete specimens of this animal. And it's rather impressive. And, you know, from the neck back, it naively looks a lot like a camel, sort of camel proportions. Its skull is just plain weird. Um, and it's got these nostril opening, or more properly, the nearest, the opening of the nasal passage way up on the back of the head. And it remains a big question as to what exactly the life appearance of this animal was like. And traditionally, people give it a, a trunk, either taper-like or longer. 
Uh, but there's some argument that no, maybe it's more of an inflated sack on the head. And its relationship to other mammals uh, has remained, well, remained for quite some time a, a big question, as did the other major discovery in terms of the vertebrate fossils by Darwin, which is this critter, Toxodon, which um, as he, he writes up, is one of the strangest animals ever discovered. Uh, it turns out he didn't actually find the bones himself. Uh, he heard about some local farmhouse where they had collected the skull of a strange animal. And so he rode there over there and for the value of 18 pence, uh, purchased this specimen so that's photographs of the specimen, and here's drawings from Owen's uh, lithogra oh, lithographs from Owen's paper on it, given the name Toxodon. And Toxodon was just an unusual creature. It was hard to place. Here is a reconstruction of the whole animal. It is, in some ways, vaguely a hippo or rhino-like analog for the latest part of the Pleistocene of South America. And like Macrocania is part of a native South American radiation of hoofed mammals. Um, just to show you some of the confusion over what it might be, this was from the 1960 rewrite, uh, second edition of The Voyage of the Beagle. And Darwin in here saying that Owen's pointing out it's got some aspects that are like the NARS, that would be um, glirase, uh, rodents and, um, and, and rabbits. Uh, which she says are some of the smallest of the quadrupeds. Other ways are kind of like the pachyderms, like elephants and so forth. It has attributes in terms of its skull, which are like dugongs and manatee. You know, how wonderfully are the different orders at the present time so well separated, blended together at different points to the structure, of, uh, different points of the structure of the toxodon. So a very strange animal and mysterious to us for quite some time. Now in recent years, based on protein, preserved protein data, and some genomic data uh, from both Macrocania and Toxodon, which lived close enough in time that there is remnants of some of this uh, material. Uh, they come out as relatives, extinct relatives of the perissodactyls overall. So the group of tapers, rhinos, and horses, but not within that group. Uh, their closest living relatives, however, are the perissodactyls. So it'll be interesting to see if we get more of this sort of evidence from other of these South American native ungulates to see if they form a particular radiation of a single branch there, or if we're actually getting multiple parts of the placental family tree forming ungulate-like forms in the history of South America's isolation. So that's an overview of Darwin's major contributions to vertebrate paleontology. Uh, we often don't think of things like glyptodon and giant ground sloths as necessarily Darwin discoveries, or indeed the South American native ungulates, but indeed they are. And they, they were famous in his own lifetime. This was prior to the Natural History Museum's uh, collections being their own thing. This is at the Hunterian Museum of the Royal uh, College of Surgeons with some of the Darwin ground sloths and glyptodonts and so forth on display. Um, it's also worth noting, and to sort of wrap these things up, that the contributions or thinking about vertebrate fossils were really important for Darwin coming to grips with the reality of evolution by natural selection. Um, because he doesn't write so much about it in the origin, because in the origin, he focuses on the more sort of data dense parts of the observations of the natural world. But those weren't necessarily what got him thinking about it to begin with. So in his notebooks here, he's writing that Cuvier, of course, a great paleontologist himself, objects to transpropagation of species by saying, why not have some intermediate forms been discovered between paleotherium, megalonyx, and other ground sloth, mastodon, and the species now living. Now, according to my view, in South America, the parent of all armadillos and by this sense, he actually means sort of Xenarthrins in general, might be brother to Megatherium, the uncle now dead. And so even at this point in the 1830s, he's recognizing that a way of thinking about the fossil record is not simply direct ancestor descendant relationship, but cousin relationships, or as we might now say, sister group relationships, branching off from some even earlier form that's distinct from either of the descendant groups. But it is worth pointing out, as I mentioned before, 
that although these vertebrate fossils really did get him thinking about how evolution, oh, that evolution worked, there wasn't enough density of data there to really establish the processes. And so by tying together threads of many different fields, embryology, geographic distribution, geologic succession, and so forth, all tie together to show um, this way of how organisms might change over to, uh, uh, from one form to another, the famous tree of life that he was interested in, this grandeur in the view of life that he produced. But he did admit uh, to his sister, at least, there's nothing like geology, the pleasure of the first day's partridge shooting or the first day's hunting. You can tell he was a you know, rich Englishman, cannot be compared to finding a fine group of fossil bones, which tell their story of former times with almost a living tongue. So I think that's a really great statement for the emotional side that many of us find to paleontology. So here's a, a Charles Knight painting with Marokenia and Toxodon and Glyptodon, some of Darwin's great discoveries there together. I want to point out, I am not a historian of science. I didn't come together. I didn't bring this research out. I didn't go reading the manuscripts directly or anything like that, except for the stuff that's online. Other people have worked on this and I've ripped stuff off entirely from them here. And so I want to throw out two recent books of interest if, this, if these topics interest you. Adrian Lister's Darwin's Fossils, the collection that shaped the theory of evolution, and Sandra Herbert's Charles Darwin Geologist that talk about this side of Darwin that we don't hear about as much as say the collector of finches and the tosser of iguanas. Um, and so with that, that's the, the main uh, part of my talk. I want to again say uh, happy Darwin day to everyone. And since it always comes up two days later and you know, a happy Valentine's day everyone, I select you naturally. <clears throat> Thank you again. That great. was really, really great. Um, so, want a reminder to everybody to send in your questions if you have any. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was always interesting to me was the friendships and then the rifts that occur in the friendships. And I, I'm wondering if you know more about the relationship between Darwin and Owen and what it was like and how it may have changed over time. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not so certain, uh, of course, the famous flare up between not so much Darwin and Owen, but Darwinism and Owen uh, happened uh, not long after the publication of The Origin. And that was with uh, Darwin's uh, most vocal uh, proponent. And that was Thomas Henry Huxley, yet another important figure of that era, um, where at at Oxford, uh, where there was a, a conference that was held where they were discussing the then recently published uh, origin, how um, Samuel Wilberforce, the uh, uh, great archbishop, uh, was stating, using information that he had gotten from Owen uh, about how clearly it was that, um, that the human brain was extremely different in configuration than those of the uh, non-human primates. And Huxley, who had already been doing a lot of dissections of them, said, no, 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 not at all. Uh, they are, in fact, almost exactly the same. And there was personal insults flung back and forth. Uh, and apparently the crowd was in an uproar. And at, according to at least some accounts, uh, Captain Fitzroy, who was visiting there, was holding up a copy of the Bible and saying, this, this is how we get to our understanding of the world. Um, and, um, you know, each side claims that they were victors at that debate. Um, so, and, and Huxley and, and Owen certainly had many, um, many rows, not only that one, but various other ones professionally uh, throughout their career. I'm not so certain, and I don't know in detail, to what degree Owen and, um, and Darwin had problems. Uh, I know Owen didn't necessarily, well, did not agree with the conclusions of the origin and, and wrote reviews about that. But I don't know if they were personal, there was any personal animosity there. <laughs> One thing that's important to know about Darwin too is that he, his sensitive stomach only got worse over time and people have been speculating about different possible biological causes. And he didn't participate 
wow, this, I mean, I'm about to make the real connection with the modern pandemic world. He didn't participate in person very much in the uh, conferences and debates and so forth for much of his life. Uh, he didn't go to many of these meetings because he was very sensitive in terms of his health. He stayed at Downhouse um, doing his writing and it was mostly via you know the internet at the time, which was you know letters. Uh, and correspondences, but he was a, a huge correspondent, sending letters all over the world uh, with people of all sorts of walks of life. Um, if they had Zoom back in that era, I'm sure he would have spent a lot more time doing that. So, All right, so at this point, uh, like Blaine said, I'm going to remind everybody that if you have a question for Dr. Holtz, go ahead and throw it in the comments on Facebook. And again, if you can't leave a comment on Facebook, I'm keeping an eye on the Gray Fossil Site Twitter and Instagram accounts. We've got a couple questions already coming in. Gino asks, did Darwin also find any Gomphothere fossils in South America? You know, I can't recall offhand if he did. Um, he definitely tried, since he, he was not primarily a vertebrate anatomist, he often made mistakes in his field uh, identifications, what well, we all do. But uh, so some of his notes would sometimes refer to finding megatheres or mastodons or something, and then it, well, mastodons, and it subsequently turns out to be giant ground sloths or things of that nature. He may well have um, come across some, but I, I personally don't know of any offhand. And to my knowledge, none of the gonfathiers, none of the named gonfathiers are based on specimens he discovered. I, one thing that I was speculating about while writing this talk is what if instead of winding up in these Pleistocene gravel deposits, he had somehow wound up in the Triassic or the Cretaceous of Argentina and you know we find Eoraptor in the 1830s rather than the 1990s. You know, preempting all the discoveries of the 1870s in the American West. You know, our, our understanding of dinosaurs would have been radically changed. You know, the Crystal Palace dinosaurs would have been walking around on their hind legs with hands out like that and so forth. So, um, I should mention actually that uh, at least two. Darwin discoveries are on display at the Crystal Palace. There, I believe there's a glyptodon. Wait, I may be wrong with that. I know that at least one was planned. I can't remember if they made one or not. And then the megatherium in the Crystal Palace models is based on the skeleton at the British Museum or the, the Natural History Museum of London, which is using specimens that he found, so. Very cool. Our next question. Uh, is from Charlie who asks, did Alfred Wallace make any fossil discoveries to support his similar theories of evolution at the same time? That's a really good question. And I don't know enough about specific Wallace discoveries per se. Um, now he was working far more in, um, well, since his, his day job was collecting specimens in primarily in rainforest communities uh, for sale back back home uh, for collectors back in, in Europe and uh, the New World and so forth. Um, he may not have been in environments that were necessarily great outcrops for fossil discoveries, as opposed to Darwin going through you know the dry lands of, uh, of South America. Um, so it may be that he didn't really have that much opportunity. Now, of course, there are fossils in Indonesia at the time was the Malay Archipelago, but um, in Indonesia, but I honestly don't know offhand if he was actively looking for those. He certainly was concentrating on um, on birds, plants, uh, insects, and so forth, the sort of things that could be shipped back for display in collections in the rest of the world. But unfortunately, almost all of his collection was destroyed when the boat sank. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's Absolutely. Yeah. There's a great animation about Wallace's adventures uh, somewhere online that I've seen before. Maybe I'll have to find it and share it around. Chris, did you have a question? Well, I was just wondering, you know, a lot of the fossils that Darwin collected were pretty scrappy. You know, they, they were fragments of this and fragments of that. You know, how, how, and, and then he, he continued to, you know, live and write and think, 
uh, for many years after his voyage in, in the Beagle, how many of those taxa that he made the first discoveries of, was he able to kind of, you know, subsequent discoveries put together a skeleton that, that sh showed him what that animal might have been? I mean, are there certain groups that, uh, you know, kind of came together pretty quickly after he sent those, those fossils back or was he stuck in this world of fragments? Yeah, um, now uh, some of them were pretty good. The Skeleta theory, for instance, was really good. But I think a fair number of them, it would require later workers, like the Amagino brothers, uh, two great figures in the history of Argentine paleontology. They weren't born until, I think, the 1850s. So they would have been beginning to collect during his lifetime, but long after his primary uh, work had come out. Um, and those, those two, I believe, were, um, were among the first to get some of the more complete of the South American native mammals. Um, the advantage with the ground sloths is that the initial discoveries of Megatherium in the 1700s included a substantial fraction of the skeleton. So at least they had a model to work with. Um, and I think there may have been a fair amount of Toxodon found in his lifetime that maybe they were aware a bit more of what it looked like, but I'm not positive about that. Certainly the better specimens would be discovered later in the 1800s and into the 1900s. Got another question here that uh, I know, uh, uh, Tom, this is a fun question. And I know since Blaine's a Darwin fan, Blaine might have an answer to this too. Jenny asks, Wonder what Darwin would think if he only knew how celebrated he is today. Mm. Wow, yeah. Well, I said he was, he was to a large degree a private individual, uh, but he also liked recognition. Um, so I'm sure he wouldn't have been displeased. Um, I think he probably would, would have said, you know, okay, you know, sure, I came up with this, but Wallace came up with this as well, and so forth. Um, but um, yeah, good question. I don't know if, if Lainey yeah, yeah, I think yeah. almost certainly would have been happy, but if there was a yeah. party for it, he wouldn't have gone. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, along those lines, uh, you mentioned a party. Gretchen asked, if you guys all had a dinner party with Darwin today, what <laughs> topics or questions would you be sure to discuss with him? <laughs> if he even showed up, Blaine. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. I mean, it would be great to show him so much that we found ever since. Um, and I was, look at this, look at how cool this is. Um, and um, I think the thing that, you know, since I'm not a geneticist and I wouldn't be able to do genetics justice or anything like that, or developmental biology, which he would have been really interested in, um, would be uh, things I would like to have shared with him is first of all, how weird fossil life was compared to what a Victorian would have thought you know, he, he lived long enough to have seen the first sauropod dinosaurs and Stegosaurus and so forth discovered, but all these weird things of the ancient world and plate tectonics to give him a sense of how it is that the structure of the earth operates, something he was interested in, but didn't have the context uh, because the geophysics wasn't there yet. Um, so that would be something I would love to share with him. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know about uh, if you guys yeah. can think of. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the first thing would be you were right about variation. And, mm -hmm. here's, and, here's what, <laughs> and here's why we know that. And then here's the geneticist that can start walking you through the process. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, one of the good things about people of that era in general, and he's a good example of it, is they wrote down so many of their thoughts and notes that we have even stuff that he, did, he wouldn't publish in his lifetime. So we, we could see some of the stuff he was thinking about. Um, mm -hmm. Not to say he, there might not have been secrets that he had that he never put down and to, to know what those were would have been really cool. But. Yeah. This next question, this is a, 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 a I'll, I'll just go ahead and ask it. <laughs> Melissa <laughs> says, Darwin helped piece together so many different ideas that helped propel the natural sciences who are today's Darwins? Ooh, 
I, th I think I think the fair thing to say is that because the community of scientists is so much or multiple orders of magnitude larger um, that we can't we don't have any single Darwin anymore. We have both such immense specialization that uh, we, we concentrate really on the small fields, but also that in the big picture context, instead it's hard, it would be hard for one person to really tie together and create so many new things that it's more like a web of a huge number of interconnections going on, uh, distributed rather than concentrated in, in one guy or a small number of, of folks. Yeah, and I think it would be sort of mind blowing for somebody like Darwin to learn about how vast science is now yeah. and how many different sub disciplines there are. And, and like Thomas was saying, you know, the Osbournes, the Copes, the Marshes, those kinds of people that are sort of cross disciplinary across so many different fields. You can't do that now because yeah. there's so much information in all the sub disciplines. I mean, you can get people who are semi approximations of it, but it's still not not complete. Like um, Jared Diamond, mm -hmm. you know, you're going from someone who comes from a wow, like biochemistry background, but then also gets interested in uh, birds of the South Pacific and so forth. But then for New Guinea, and so from that he gets interested in cultures and so forth, and um, you know, Stephen Jay Gould was an example of someone who, in terms of his research specialty, was, you know, what, late Cenozoic land snails, and yet he touched in his writing on so many different ideas, but wasn't necessarily someone who was creating or synthesizing those ideas in, a, in the way that Darwin was looking at this bit and look at this bit and, this bit and himself synthesized it. These other people, many of them are, are reporting and making connections on other people's discoveries and which is an important thing. We need that, we need that as well. So. Uh, these last few questions actually lead nicely into a question that I was thinking of mm. positing. And this is something, Dr. Holtz, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then also Blaine and Chris, if you'd like. Um, obviously, Darwin uh, was a major influence on science as we know it. And, uh, but then, of course, as you've hinted at a little bit in your talk, uh, he wasn't right about everything. There are things, mm -hmm. ideas of his that are outdated now, both scientifically and also perhaps socially. Mm -hmm. And I, whenever we talk about Darwin and figures like Darwin, I always think of this risk that we run in science of overly idolizing yes. or idealizing individual people. And so my question uh, uh, for you is, to what extent do you feel that Darwin deserves his legacy? Is it, are we overblowing Darwin or is it really, you know, how, how much of Darwin uh, has earned this status that we've given him these days? Ooh, yeah, good one. Hmm. Um, well, although there were contemporaries and precursors who hit on some of the elements that he came up with in terms of discovering evolution by means of natural selection, he really was the first to tie all those threads together. So in that sense, he was a discoverer. Um, and many of the core ideas have withstood the test of time. Um, so in that context, you know, um, I think definitely we should still recognize the ability to take all these disparate lines of evidence and time together is an important way of doing science that we sometimes, well, we often aren't able to do, given the way science is constructed today. Um, and um, important to remember that, you know, he was a he had ideas, some ideas which were not particularly socially acceptable by our time. On the other hand, it's also very important. And there are some people who automatically say, hey, it's a white guy in the 1800s. Clearly he was you know, horrible against other races. His family was famous as being major abolitionists in the UK. And he himself, the strongest conflict he ever had with Fitzroy was nothing to do with evolution and nothing to do with religion. It had to do with slavery. And Darwin was an adamant anti-slave um, advocate. 
and Fitzroy was the, that was the appropriate place for those people in society. And that became an issue that was almost forced Darwin to cancel the rest of the voyage and go back home. And they eventually came to the accommodation where they were simply would never talk about it again um, to each other. And that was what they needed to do to keep the voyage going. So uh, um, he, he, he had ideas which at his time were fairly radical, which now seem obvious to us. But so, you know, those you have to think someone has to start thinking about those ideas and promulgating them for them to take off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you know, for his time, in, in so many ways, he was so progressive in his thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to always put it in that context. And when you think about celebrating individuals and their ideas, um, he's one that I would you know, definitely put at the top of my list as people and ideas to celebrate. Mm -hmm. I think that, that actually ties back to an earlier question. What would we want to show him about science today is who's doing science today? Mm -hmm. And that would be a good thing. It's not just privileged white Europeans and European Americans, it's the whole, all kinds of people from all around the world um, and, you know, making the contributions for the further understanding of the natural world. All right. That's a great, great. place to stop. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are at about our time. Do we want to wrap up? There are a few other questions uh, if we want to address them, if we can, if you want to stick around sure. a few extra minutes. Yeah. I, I could answer a few more questions. Sure. Okay. Then we well, go. then yeah. let's go through a couple more of these. Ethan asked, what was the general reception of Darwin among vertebrate paleontologists at the time? Oh, that, you have to extend it out a little bit because 1859 is still pretty early for there to be much in the way of vertebrate paleontologists. Uh, and that's, you know, Leidy is already writing in, uh, in North America, but there aren't too many others yet. Um, but by the later 1800s, you had definitely factionalism going on within the field. So O.C. Marsh, for all his other quirks, uh, was very much convinced by Darwin's arguments and wrote very favorably about Darwin. He met Huxley and the two of them uh, looked through the Yale Peabody collections together and so forth. Whereas Cope was very much anti-Darwin, uh, was sort of a more neo-Lamarckian view of life history, as was one of Cope's major followers, Henry Fairfield Osborne. So taking us into the early 20th century, Osborne did not accept natural selection as the driving force, the driving cause of diversity, and instead had these ideas of aristogenesis that there are these metaphysical drives that produce change over time and that natural selection may operate but wasn't sufficient to produce the diversity we see in the fossil record. In part, that may be because uh, in, the, in Osborne's case, that Osborne accepted sort of the Kelvin time scale that had been developed mm -hmm. where the Cretaceous paleogene, well at the time Cretaceous tertiary boundary was only 3 million years ago. So to explain all of the Cenozoic diversity of mammals in the course of 3 million years, it might be tough to get natural selection to sort out through just variation in a population to go from, you know, earliest Paleogene mammals to, uh, to Pleistocene ones. So um, that may have been one of the reasons that he could scientifically justify, although people argue there were other social reasons why a member from the upper crust of American society might uh, might also be into these ideas. So there definitely were, were pro-Darwinists. I know there was one of the European proboscidian workers of the late 19th century, and I can't remember who it was, who was a big, strong uh, Darwin advocate, but plenty had other models of, of, of evolution. I should say, I should add, though, put in the context, after Darwin's writing came out, with the exception of some old fashioned folks like Louis Agassiz and so forth, most paleontologists were convinced that evolution happened. And the argument was, what is the, what causes evolution? What causes the diversification of species? Is it the differential sorting of variations in a population or is it something else? 
right? We've got three more questions on my list and I'm gonna cut it off there. We can go through these relatively quickly if you'd like. Okay. Jenny asked, has the Equus tooth Darwin found in Bahia Blanca ever been researched? Stable isotopes, et cetera. That I <laughs> do not know. <laughs> um, I showed you the picture of it that I ripped off the internet. It might be. I know there have been um, some recent studies of this subgenus Amorhippus, uh, and it's a, apparently a specimen of that. Um, so it may be it might be one of the specimens in those particular studies, but I do not know. I don't even know the specimen number offhand, so that would be worth <laughs> investigating. Donna asks, how much did the religious zealots of the day influence what Darwin could actually publish? What was the question again? I, it, it sort of glitched out with me for a moment. Oh, no problem. Okay. Donna asked, how much did the religious zealots of the day influence what Darwin could actually publish? Ah, well, it's, um, it's been thought in part that the reason in the origin he doesn't touch, for instance, human origins, except for one line in the epilogue, is that he, d he wanted to get the case for natural selection dealt with first, before he would then go on, and as he did in a later volume, to tackle the specific issue of, of evolution of humans and that humans are part of the animal uh, tree of life. Um, additionally, the reason he waited, part of the reason he waited until later in life to publish The Origin, he, he had a manuscript in the 1840s, early 1840s, ready to go, but the, um, um, oh, and skipping my mind, the name of the, the book that came out, it was published anonymous, uh, anonymously, but it was by Chambers, as I just discovered, was an advocate an advocation of an evolutionary worldview, and it wasn't really well argued, and it was torn apart in the popular, in the review literature in the 1840s. And so he said, whoa, okay, even though I've got these ideas now, I'm going to have to wait and establish my credibility as a scientist and then revisit it when I'm an older man. In fact, he was probably going to wait until the 1860s or later until he got the letter from Wallace and he said, okay, we got to do something about that. And, is that vestiges? I yeah, thank you. That's vestiges. it. Yeah, yeah, vestiges. Yes, that's it. Absolutely. That, that right. stirred a lot of okay. people up, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then our very last question, mm -hmm. and we'll leave it at this, uh, which brings us back to that question before of how we remember ca uh, characters like Darwin. Eric, this is Eric Scott, says, Eric. Might, Darwin, uh, might Darwin be thought of in a somewhat analogous manner to Alfred Wegener? Like Darwin, Wegener had important observations and documentation with respect to continental drift, but also like Darwin with respect to his views on heredity, Wegener lacked an effective working mechanism for his views, yet I don't believe that we idolize Wegener the same way we do Darwin. Yeah, well, first of all, I'll add, Eric, if you have a good answer to that horse question from before, <laughs> post that, give them the answer, because if, if, if anyone knows, it's you. Um, and then, yeah, to compare, you know, Wegener's contribution to uh, to Darwin. I think the reason people are more, two reasons, people are more more idolized Darwin and make it more central, um, is he was more convincing to a larger part of the scientific community when his work came out, and therefore people picked up on him um, to a greater degree than Continental Drift when it came out uh, was was a lot, had met a lot more resistance within the scientific community. Um, and I think on a sort of more metaphysical level, where the diversity of life comes from and where we human beings come from, I think hits people a lot more home than do the continents move on geologic time scales. And that's the reason people are, are more interested in them. But yeah, absolutely great example. A lot of basic data from multiple lines of evidence pointing towards an aspect of reality, but a couple key elements not there yet to convince everyone entirely. All right, well, we'll wrap it up with questions there. Thanks to everybody uh, who asked us questions and who joined in today. And if you have more questions for Dr. Holtz, I'm sure you can find him abundantly on the social media. Yep. <laughs> uh, and pepper him with questions there. Great. Well, thank you again for being on the show and happy Darwin Day to everybody. Yep, happy Darwin Day. <laughs> All right.